Howdy, how's it going? My name's Davy Chappie, and today it's time to take a walk through history. Well, not real history, but the fake history of Eberron. See, this history's got a long war with no real conclusion, an industrial revolution, and an entire country getting the shit bombed out of it. See? Totally fake. I'm gonna be going over the Last War of Corvair, which is the single most defining moment of Eberron's backstory, affecting practically every single stone you'll ever walk on during your own adventures. As always, this is just my personal recollection of events, and I'm admittedly more worried about giving you a good time than I am about learning your stuff, so if I get something wrong, feel free to tell me about it in the description below. Also, this video picks up right where the last chapter left off, so if you haven't seen that yet, you should go check it out sometime. Also, also, let me just give a quick shout out to Darian Boulderfist, That Guy Boom 45, Dylan Sylvester, Zwolfy, Sadistic Rat, Austin L, John Almar, for their poor fiscal choices in giving me that sweet, sweet Patreon money. Y'all can be rest assured knowing that your Davy is proud of you. But with that out of the way, let's begin. So when we last left off, Corvair had found peacetime under the the Flag of Galifair, a monarchy that spanned the entire continent and was founded by the wise and just King Galifair Erwinard, a man who had managed to manifest his destiny over the five great nations not through war and bloodshed, but with diplomacy and negotiation, and a huge army that you would be really scared to disagree with. It took him 24 years, but when he was done, he cemented his rule over the five kingdoms by naming them all after his five children, Undare, the magical country, Breland, the main trading country, Sire, the artisan country, and Thrain, the religious country. His fifth son, Karn, already had the fifth nation, Karnath, the military country named after him, because he himself was named after the known pacifist, Karn the Conqueror. Later on, when King Galifair finally stepped down as king, his son Sire would take the throne, and after him came his son, Galifair II, and so on and so forth, until the reign of the last king of Galifair, King Jarrett Erwinarn. Now, Jarrett was the most paranoid king that Galifair had ever had, and his paranoia spanned to everything and everyone that he could think of, from the elves off in Arenal, to the dragons in Arganesson, to the 13 powerful dragonmarked houses. Okay, he might have had a point with that last one, we'll get to the dragon marks in a different video. And Jarrett's excessive paranoia led him to bolster the defenses of the kingdom to an extreme degree. He created floating fortresses in Breland, a secret army of mechanical warriors in Sire, and threw a massive amount of gold into bolstering the military of Galifair's five nations. But, as fate likes to do, it was Jarrett's paranoia over invisible enemies that proved to be the greatest enemy of all. Upon his death, Jarrett's next in line, Princess Michonne of Sire, was set to take the throne after him. Unfortunately, all of Michonne's siblings knew what an absolute tosser she was and rejected her claim to the throne. Prince Thalon of Thrain, Prince Caius of Carnath, and Princess Roan of Breland all decided decided to take the throne for themselves, with each sibling proclaiming themselves the king of their individual nations. Only Prince Rogar of Undare would remain loyal to Michonne, and that was only because he swore an oath to his father Jarrett to, you know, not start a massive war over wanting his older sister's stuff. Unfortunately, the other siblings had no such oath to abide by, and everyone suddenly had the same catastrophic thought run through their heads at the very same time. Wait a minute, I want to be the ruler of Galifair instead, and my daddy just gave me my own army, so let's kick some shit up! And thus the last war began. It was a great war, it was bloody. It was a scene, it was was an arms race. Now, a lot happened during the last war that was never specified so that dungeon masters could make their own shit up and go from there. But what we do know is that it lasted a whole 102 years, everybody fought everybody at some point, and none of the nations were spared from the turmoil. We also know that one of the dragon marked houses, House Caneth, had sold all of the nations, the machine warriors that Jarrett had commissioned while he was still alive, which only exacerbated the problem since it created even more bodies for each nation to throw at each other. But the nations were all affected by war in more personal ways as well. Undare, the most magically inclined nation of the five, mostly stayed in a dick measuring contest between Karnath and Thrain, with an army of arcane knights on horseback and peasants whipping out their wands standing little chance against a swift kick to the stiff dick. Their excessive focus on the war effort also caused them to ignore the problem of marauders and demons that came from the demon wastes that were plaguing their woodland areas known as the Elding Reaches, which led to the Elding Reaches being liberated by a massive druid sect known as the Wardens of the Wood, which led to it subsequently declaring its independence from Ondare, since the only thing that phenomenal cosmic power can't beat is old men who don't shower. Moving on, Breland had always been a land of freedom and democracy, and so they spread it the only way lovers of freedom know how, by invading other countries and calling it liberty. Their main headache during the war came from an area to the west of Breland called Drome, which was a lawless field of endless monsters that bordered an even more lawless wasteland of endless monsters to their west called the Shadow Marshes. Drome was always technically a part of Breland, but no one ever went there due to the aforementioned endless monsters, so when war started, the monsters just became a general nuisance to the Breelish people. That is, until a trio of hags known as the Daughters of Sorokel showed up and started subjugating every monster they saw under their will. Once the war ended, Drome actually started to look like a real nation, although none of the other nations ever officially recognized it, but let's be honest, who's about to take it from them? Thrain, on the other hand, took a much more, uh 
crusading approach to the war. They tossed out their old monarchy of listening to the laws of one person and their devout followers, and they embraced the Theocracy of the Silver Flame, a religion about listening to the laws of one being and its devout followers. Their army, as you would expect, had the most clerics and paladins in it out of any of the five nations, and they fought with the power of God and anime on their side. Unfortunately, of all the nations, Thrain was the one that lost the most land to the other four Galifarian nations, and they ended up being the most bitter about it. Even after the war ended, Thrain tried to keep itself the most self-sufficient just so that it wouldn't have to go out and make eye contact with any of those godless heathens. Of course, without a doubt, the biggest and scariest crusading army had to come from Karnak, since they decided to bolster their forces with an UNDEAD ARMY OF THE DAMNED. Since to the royal military of Karnath, death is occupational, and it does not mean that you get to go home early. Karnath had actually managed to use their elite shock troops known as the Order of the Emerald Claw to assassinate Mashan of Sire early in the war, only for her to be succeeded by her son, who would go on to continue the fighting and end nothing. Karnath also had a massive food problem that was only solved when King Caius made a deal with a group known as the Blood of Vol to give the nation food in return for transforming Caius into a vampire for the lols. Caius, not about to have a best-selling book series written about him, faked his death and hid away until the war was over, at which point he returned to his throne under the guise of Caius III, his own great-grandson, and subsequently tried to keep the peace going for as long as his fake mustache and glasses would hold. Besides the five great nations, the independent province of Zalargo was able to avoid getting raffle-stomped by everyone else's army by throwing up its hands and going, WE SUPPORT THE TRUE Galifarian KING, without specifying who they were talking about, effectively making them a neutral province. The Talenta Plains stood between Sire and Karnath, and was technically claimed by both, though it ended up pushing out both sides through the power of halflings riding on dinosaurs, although eventually even their resolve broke and the plains got churned to metaphorical mulch. The Marar Holds, a huge-ass mountain range full of dwarves that had sworn fealty to Galifair, looked at the fine print and decided that, since all the Galifarian nations were fighting, Galifair was no more, and they subsequently closed the doors to their mountains and threw rocks at anybody who tried to get in. Kubara and the Lazar principalities basically did fuck all since they had the benefit of being on the other side of the Marar Holds to keep them away from the war, although the Lazar principalities did go through a phase where they started pillaging everybody for a little while. And that left Sire. Poor... Poor sire. The nation of artistry and wealth, which by blood should have had their queen rule over Galifair all along. To which the people of Sire saw the whole war as one big middle finger signed by the other nations. It went from being a shining hub of creation and ingenuity to a raised battlefield of death and sad times as, since Sire was smack dab in the middle of all the other nations, most of the war was fought on Sire and ground. To make matters worse, a group of asshole elves called the Valais Tairn sprouted up from the woodworks during the war and threw an absolute manic fit of blood and pain until they were able to section off a part of Sire for themselves, which they called Valinar. And to really pile on the pain, since the forge that created the Warforged was privately owned by House Caneth, Sire wasn't able to have all the best goodies, because even though it was their land that the forge was built on, it was not like they could force the forge to give them an army, since, you know, the forge had an army to defend themselves with. Pretty much any possible problem that could occur for Sire managed to happen to Sire over the course of the war. Oh, and then they exploded. Yeah, no, you heard me right. The end of the war is commonly accepted as the day known as the Day of Mourning, which was a cutesy way of saying the day that Sire fucking exploded in a blast of magical energy for no fucking reason. Well, to be fair, there's probably a reason, but no one knows what it is, so common knowledge is that all the people of Sire were just minding their own business that day when BAM! A magical fog rapidly expanded over all of Sire, stopping perfectly at the border of the country and instantly killing everyone inside. This caused the remaining nations to all collectively turn their heads like, wait, what the fuck? And soon after, the treaty of Thronehold was drafted to officially end the war so that there would be no more mass extinction. The treaty recognized all of the nations that had broken off from the five main nations, as well as any independent nations, as all their own countries to rule as they deemed proper. Although noticeably, Drome and Sire were missing due to Drome being a crazy land full of monsters, and Sire being, well, exploded. Speaking of which, in a brilliant display of tone deafness, from that explosion onward, Sire would henceforth be referred to as the Mornland. This would prove to piss off the newly refugeed Sirens that weren't in the country when the morning happened, and while Breland opened up a refugee refugee camp labeled New Sire, it did little to quell the anger of the once favored people of Galifair. In fact, a lot of people were still pissed off about things that happened during the war. And now, with the Treaty of Thronehold established to cease the fighting, the continent of Corvair is left in a massive unease as everyone waits for the single spark to reignite 100 years of misery. This is about where the game begins, and although there is still plenty of Eberronian lore to talk about, this is about as far as you really need to know to start out as a player in the grand world of Eberron. But that'll about do it. I hope you enjoyed this video, leave a like and comment if you did, subscribe if you want to be a cool dude, and maybe support me on Patreon so that I can slowly make my entire life revolve around D&D. Also, if you want to stay up to date on all of your Davy news, I keep a link to my Discord and Twitter in the description below. But yeah, Davy out.